can just start. The recording has uh, has started, and welcome to those of you that have joined us in the flesh, as it were, this evening, and um, and welcome to uh, a couple of hundred of you that will join us in the future on the YouTube channel. Um, next next month we've got Gemma, uh, Dr. Gemma Richardson from the Geological Survey, joining us. And she's heading up their geomagnetism team. So Gemma will be talking about that. Um, we've got a, a training seminar coming up, which I've already notified. Uh, I've, I've sent notes around. Uh, we've got uh, Marcus Marcus Leach doing a a, a couple of hours on new new radio. Um, so for those of you that are trying to get your head around that, I think that'll. Uh, take us forward. Um, this evening, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce once again um, Whit Reeve. Uh, it seems to me that whatever subject you want to choose in the realm of radio astronomy, particularly in terms of what the independent researcher can do, then Whit is your man. And uh, he's got a vast amount of experience and uh, tonight he's going to be talking about his um, active rural uh, research using the, the HARP facility. So um, thanks again, Wit, for joining us. And um, I'm going to hand over to you now. Our monitors are yours, Wit. All right. Sounds good then. Thanks, Paul. Can you hear me OK? Yes. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Well, oh, you won't let me do it yet. Oh, did I not do that? I do apologize. Air screen, yeah, that should be. Have a go now. Oh, there we go. Much better. Okay, you should be able to see a PowerPoint. Yes, that's working. And now you should see full screen. Indeed. Excellent. Everything seems to be working OK. OK, the topic, uh, by the way, Paul, thanks for inviting me back. I must not have tortured you uh, enough with my uh, geomagnetism uh, lecture here a while back. So I'm, I'm glad to be back, and uh, I appreciate the invite. I'm going to talk about the high frequency active auroral research program that's uh, up here in Alaska and that I'm involved in. And um, so here's kind of a list of what I'm going to go through today. I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. And then we'll get into the HARP, what it does and how it does it. And we'll look at some photographs of the uh, facility that I've taken over the last maybe five years or so. And uh, I've got a list of web links and references at the very end that if you're interested uh, in, in getting those, I can send them to you separately. Who I am? Well, I'm now a, or have been a SARA member uh, since about 2008. I think I joined in early 2008. I'm also a, a BAA member. I have been the, a, a contribut contributing editor for the Sarah Journal for several years now. I did a stint as an editor of the journal uh, a number of years ago. And now I'm a contributing editor. You probably, if you're a member of Sarah, you've probably seen some of my articles. I'm a lifelong Alaskan, uh, worked telecommunications and radio engineering uh, practically all my life. I've owned uh, Reeve Engineers engineering company since 1975. I retired my engineering license in, in 2009, and, but I still use the company to manufacture instrumentation uh, that I sell around the world. And I, one of the things that I've done um, is that I don't sell anything that I don't use. 
And so I've established three observatories around Alaska. And here's a map of, of Alaska. Um, I'm in Anchorage, which is in what we call South Central Alaska. And that um, observatory I built in 2008, and it works as a local control point for remote observatories, one at a, in a small rural community called Coho, uh, that's southwest of Anchorage. And then, of course, the one uh, that I built up at HARP in 2019, um, which is in kind of interior Alaska. Um, and I'll be going into that in great, uh, a lot more detail here as we move along. What I do is um, I, I'm kind of focused on solar radio, um, HF through UHF bands. Um, I use the uh, Callisto radio spectrometer mostly for that. I also have other receivers that I use, uh, the long wavelength array antenna. Um, I use that at Coho, uh, excellent antenna for solar radio work. I've also been involved with the Jupiter radio um, in the HF band, roughly 20 megahertz or so, more like 15, maybe to 28 megahertz. Um, my main interest is radio science and radio propagation. Um, I did uh, recently uh, gave a presentation at the SARA conference on meteor trail reflections. So that's one of the uh, things that uh, I've been involved in. I use HF uh, transmitters for that. Uh, our WWV and WWVH time and frequency stations, uh, they're both about 4,000 kilometers from Anchorage. And I use those for meteor trail and aurora reflections. And then of course the uh, geomagnetism using the SAM-3 magnetometer has a, been a big project for me. And I support the Space Weather Underground program. Uh, that's um, the University of New Hampshire and the University of Alaska participate in. I first got involved with uh, HARP um, back in uh, 2016, uh, about a year after the University of Alaska took over the facility from the uh, US Air Force. And um, they, they had open houses uh, in 2016, 17, and 18. And you could do a self tour or they had uh, guided tours as well. But I chose to do the self tours uh, because I was interested in specific things. And, uh, and so spent all my time basically by myself walking around looking at stuff. Um, I wrote a bunch of articles about HARP about the uh, tours and, and uh, open houses. And that caught the attention of somebody up there. And so they invited me for a personal in, uh, tour of the facility in 2019. And um, I got to look at everything. Uh, in fact, a lot of stuff that I hadn't seen before. And one of the things that I noticed was this TCI 540 HF antenna that was off in the brush and at the time was unused. And I asked about it and they, if uh, I made a comment that, boy, I'd sure like to hook up to that thing. And they said, well, you can, there's no problem with that. And um, here's a, a line drawing of that antenna. It's quite a substantial HF antenna. Each one of these towers, uh, and there's four towers, they're a hundred feet or roughly 30 meters uh, high and um, 130 feet on, uh, on the uh, distance between the towers. So it's quite a, a complicated antenna. Um, it's whole, horizontally polarized, operates up to 30 megahertz. And it originally was a Department of Defense, a, a US Department of Defense project that was not at all related to HARP. Uh, they just used the ground up there for the antenna. And um, they, of course, this was turned over to the University of Alaska, and I was able to hook up to it. Um, I, I used um, the Callisto solar radio spectrometer with it, and, uh, and plus a specially designed up converter of one of my own designs that operated from four to 40 megahertz. And uh, uh, that I ran that for um, a couple of years until uh, spring of this year, 
the U.S. Naval Research Lab uh, wanted to use that antenna for a project they had going. And uh, since I support everything that goes on at, at HARP, uh, that was no problem with me. So we converted that antenna to a transmit antenna in, uh, for the NRL in the summer of 2021. And they used it in a research campaign here just last June. Um, another thing that I had done up at HARP is uh, installed a Radio Joe receiver and a dual dipole. Uh, that was done in 2019, in the fall of 2019. And since it is um, near the TCI antenna and um, the NRL was using, was transmitting on that antenna, we decided to, to decommission Radio Jove and relocate it. And that's what I'm uh, heading, I'm headed up to HARP on Tuesday next uh, to work on reinstalling Radio Jove, dual dipole, a new LWA antenna and the Callistos. And hopefully I'll get at least part of that done next week. Okay, HARP, what, what does HARP do? Well, its main job is to transmit uh, really, really powerful radio waves into a fairly localized area of the ionosphere directly above the facility. And it works at altitudes um, uh, or the altitudes of interest are uh, in the, in the uh, D region, all the way up to the F region, uh, 350 kilometers altitude or so. And the frequencies that are used are important characteristic frequencies or their harm harmonics. And I'll mention that a little bit more here in a minute. Now the radio waves that are being transmitted up into the ionosphere transfer energy to the electrons up there and uh, raise, raising their temperature. And then a lot of interesting things happen when you do that. Now these clouds of electrons expand, um, but they, they can't just uh, randomly expand. They're forced to expand along magnetic field lines. And up at HARP, the magnetic field um, is quite steep uh, at about a 76 degree angle uh, coming out of the uh, uh, ionosphere into the ground. Some of the things that happen are you have these uh, field aligned irregularities, and that's where the electrons are, are lined up with the uh, magnetic field lines and kind of bunch together and do all kinds of interesting things, including uh, radio wave scattering, uh, propagation effects, and so on. Now, one of the things that uh, I, I think a lot of people never really understood is that HARP uh, does not have any intrinsic radar capability. It never did, and um, it, it never will. It's basically a, um, a transmitter instrument. It's transmit only, and it's called the Ionospheric Research Instrument, or IRI. Now, most uh, of the diagnostic instruments, in other words, the sensors and receivers that um, monitor and detect the, uh, the effects of this transmitter are um, completely separate instruments. And they're not all located on site. Um, some are, uh, some are operate, uh, operated uh, hundreds of kilometers away. Some of them on uh, completely on the other side of the world. Now, um, off-site radars are used to probe the affected part of the ionosphere, um, but the, um, uh, the IRI does not have any radar capability. Now, there is uh, a project underway to add a LIDAR at uh, the HARP facility, uh, light, and, light detection and ranging, as opposed to radar or radio detection and ranging, and that is going to be used to uh, probe the area that um, the, uh, the ionospheric research instrument heats up. Now, one thing about HARP is that it's uh, pretty uniquely located at uh, 63 degrees uh, north magnetic latitude. Um, at that latitude, the geomagnetic field is connected to the outer magnetosphere. And um, the, when you have any kind of a disturbance in the magnetic field in the magnetosphere, the auroral electrojet, which is a current system in the ionosphere, um, is 
basically directly overhead at heart. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do um, having that, those characteristics. Now the ionosph uh, ionospheric research instrument, the IRI, um, adds energy to the ionosphere at important frequencies. And it's so that, so a, a name given to it is an ionospheric heater. And if you read some of the scientific papers that have been produced as a result of HARP um, research projects, you also see the term HF pump or high frequency pump. And uh, so it's basically the same instrument. It's, it's uh, the, the heater, the so-called heater. And um, the uh, diagnostic in instruments are, uh, operate from ELF um, all the way up through the UHF band. So basically a, a couple of Hertz all the way up to maybe uh, 3000 megahertz. Now the important frequencies that I keep mentioning are uh, the electron plasma frequency, which is related directly related to the electron density, which is something that can be affected by the, by the instrument. We have the gyro frequency, which is uh, related to the magnetic flux density. And then we have the collision frequency between the electrons and neutral atoms and molecules in the atmosphere. So most of these frequencies, the electron, plasma frequency, the gyro frequency are fairly low. They're in the one and a half megahertz uh, band that varies with uh, conditions. And uh, so the, the instrument itself operates at, um, at harmonics of those frequencies uh, because the lowest frequency that the, uh, the transmitter can operate at is 2.7 megahertz. So it's basically uh, the second, third and fourth and fifth harmonics that we're looking at. Uh, depending on the conditions. Now, some of the things that it can do um, is, uh, in this graphic, I'm showing the, uh, the harp instrument down here uh, at the bottom, uh, and its uh, radiation envelope reaches directly overhead. And when it heats the, uh, the area of the ionosphere shown uh, roughly between 200 and 300 kilometers altitude, um, we have these uh, field aligned irregularities that form along the magnetic field lines. And the magnetic field lines are the slope lines that you see um, here in that, in that area. And some of the things that can happen when you do that is that um, you'll have scintillation uh, at UHF from uh, satellites, for example. So if this satellite is overhead and transmits through these field aligned irregularities, you'll have up to sec, uh, 16 dB scintillation um, in the UHF band there. Now the 16 dB is a number I pulled out of a paper. That's the biggest number that I've seen uh, produced by uh, these irregularities. Uh, usually it's smaller than that, maybe 10 dB or so, which is still a significant number. Um, another, other things that can happen are maybe satellites are transmitting and using these irregularities as reflection points. And um, uh, that can reflect down to a receiver on the ground. We can also transmit from the ground up into these irregularities uh, and the radio waves will reflect and can be received on the ground down here as well. So that's just uh, one example of uh, some of the things that the IRI can do. Now, here's another interesting one here in this graphic. Um, what we're doing in this one is we're transmitting a modulated HF uh, signal up into the, uh, the heated region up here. And uh, if we modulate that uh, HF at some kilohertz uh, frequency, then that gets demodulated by nonlinearities up here in this, in this heated region. And so you have propagating out of there then are uh, the demodulated way of radio waves from that process. And then those are received on the ground uh, down here off to the lower right. So that's uh, yet another example of things that can happen. And uh, I guess the question would be, uh, why do you wanna do things like this? Well, when you, when you do things like this, you, um, I, you're able to identify 
the physics that are involved in, in, uh, in for example, this nonlinear region and demodulation. And that tells you a lot about how things work from a physical standpoint. Now, here's another example here. And this was a project that I was involved in a couple of years ago uh, where they heated um, the ionosphere uh, above the site and then beamed um, UHF. And this, this was actually in the amateur radio band. Uh, there were some radio amateurs that wanted to do this and they beamed up into this area and what they, the, what they were hoping to get was um, the, the, uh, the difference frequency uh, between what was transmitted, the, the transmit frequency and the HF carrier frequency, which I show as, as F sub zero or a, uh, F naught here. And uh, so they would transmit at FTX, that would be mixed uh, in this nonlinear region with F naught, and then the receive down here on the lower left would be the plus and minus difference, uh, or the plus and minus of that uh, combination of those two frequencies. And um, uh, I haven't seen any results from this experiment, but I'm not real sure how well it worked. I know that I didn't receive any of it in Anchorage. Uh, I could certainly see the transmitter um, here in the lower right, but I couldn't see, uh, I couldn't receive any of the, re uh, of the receiver end of it. Now, another thing that um, the HARP does is it modifies the conductivity in the uh, D region of the ionosphere uh, by using uh, certain frequencies uh, that match the D region, uh, electron density and so on. And uh, then they use optical and infrared cameras and rheometers uh, and mag magnetometers as well to probe these uh, areas that are being affected there. So that's another science uh, uh, thing that they do up there. Uh, there's also the artificial ionospheric turbulence, or AIT. Now, this is a nonlinear phenomena, um, and it takes advantage of a waveguide, a type of waveguide that uh, uh, between the E and F regions of the ionosphere. And there were some experiments done with this a few years ago um, for very long distance propagation. And by very long distance propagation, I mean, from HARP to Antarctica. Um, and that's uh, what, uh, 15,000 kilometers or something like that. It's a very long ways. And uh, what they did is they used the HARP heater or the, the transmitter, the IRI, uh, to couple a signal into this waveguide. And then they decoupled it through natural refraction at Antarctica and other locations that are long, long. Uh, far away. And uh, they found that the best propagation was along the solar terminator, or what is called the gray line. So that's um, a kind of an uh, intriguing experiment there. Another thing that happens when you heat this region of the ionosphere is that um, you, you heat it at some specific frequency with a pure carrier tone. And by the way, that HARP transmitter is extremely pure uh, when it transmits a, a carrier. And what happens is that you have these uh, sidebands that pop up and um, they can be offset from a few Hertz all the way up to a hundred kilohertz from the original carrier. So that you're transmitting this pure tone, uh, HF tone into the ionosphere and then you're able to receive, um, if, if you really crank up the power, you're able to see these sidebands that are produced in the ionosphere uh, as uh, much as 100 kilo, kilohertz offset. And uh, so what you're, uh, when, when, you, when you wanna do this, uh, the plasma frequency that I mentioned earlier has to be close to the gyro free frequency. 
And I, I don't personally understand the physics behind this, but it's still a pretty intriguing um, thing that comes out of, the prod, out of that process. Now, HARP uh, cost uh, almost 300 million bucks, um, to, uh, all, all uh, funded by US taxpayers. Uh, the Department of Defense was the one that built the uh, site and the US Air Force then operated it for almost 20 years. Um, in 2015, it was transferred to the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, uh, the Geophysical Institute up there, and they've owned and operated it ever since. And they've conducted research campaigns uh, in 2016 uh, through 2019. Everything pretty well shut down in 2020. Um, they didn't do any, any um, experiments or research campaigns in 2020, but they did one in uh, spring, summer of 2021 here just a while back. And we're working on another one for uh, fall and winter of 2021. So sometime in October, we're looking at uh, a research campaign up there. And I, I hope to get some details that I can uh, send out to everybody if you're interested in trying to detect the, the signals that come out of the HARP transmitter. Now, this is a map of the site. There's not very good contrast here. This is a Google Earth uh, map. But um, the image that I'm showing here is about five kilometers wide. And uh, down in the lower uh, right-hand corner down here is uh, there's a, a highway that drives through here. And you access the site uh, down here in the lower right. The, Ionosphere, ionospheric research instrument is this large um, light colored area here. And about a mile or uh, what, is that uh, almost two kilometers up the road is the TCI 540 antenna that I hooked up to. And that's this light area that you can see, the square that you can see here. And uh, um, the, uh, <laughs> I had my, um, uh, in uh, equipment enclosure located here. And then I had to, ran, had to run almost 250 meters of uh, coaxial cable out to, the, uh, out to the antenna. So it was quite a long run through the woods there. And uh, I had to put it in plastic pipe uh, to keep the porcupines and foxes from chewing it up. Um, if you continue up the road here, another mile or so, uh, there's some magnetometers and the optical domes and so on are uh, up up there. So it's it's pretty it's a pretty large facility and um, uh, really interesting to to visit. Now I'd like to show you some photographs of this, and I have a video here that um, it this is a, a huge file. It's like uh, 300 uh, megabytes. And so I hope it renders okay. I've played this once before at the Sarah conference and it seemed to go through okay, but I'm gonna play this. And if I can get control of it, I'll uh, try to, to um, uh, pause and explain what, what you're seeing. One of the things that you see right here in the foreground is uh, a good example of some of the uh, infrastructure that, that holds this whole thing together. Now this is the uh, IRI in the background here. These are the cross dipole antennas that you see in the background. But here in the foreground is a, uh, uh, a thermal pile. And this is the job of this guy is to keep the ground underneath frozen. Now this whole area is covered with permafrost. And as soon as you scrape off this tundra, um, that permafrost starts to melt and it turns to uh, a swamp, and it has no structural capability whatsoever. So these thermal couples are driven into the ground quite deep, and uh, they keep the ground frozen and stable. So let's start the, the drone here and see what we can do. It takes us a minute to get off the ground. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what we're seeing right here uh, are the, uh, the masts 
and the cross dipoles. And these are HF dipoles. Um, and then the transmitters are located in these white enclosures that you see down below. Now, another feature is uh, these are antenna tuning units or antenna matching units that you see. And there are actually two dipoles here. There's a high band and low, low band dipole. And there's an antenna matching unit for each one of those dipoles. So, um, and I'll, I'll explain those in, a, in an, another minute. Also on this mast is a switch that switches between the high band and low band. Um, there's these, what they call even mode load units. And these are uh, basically large resistors, uh, dummy loads, that um, because of the proximity of these dipoles, these, these operate in the two and a half or 2.7 to 10 megahertz band. So you can see they're very close in terms of wavelength. And uh, these, match, these uh, uh, even mode load units then dissipate the, uh, interact, the uh, coupling between these adjacent antennas, dissipates, them as, dissipates it as heat. So as we fly over, whoops, sorry about that. I clicked the wrong thing. We'll have to look at that again. Okay, one of the things that you'll notice is down here, um, there's uh, some dark colored boxes. This site, uh, the site where these uh, antennas are is fed with a 12 and a half kV um, medium voltage uh, distribution. Um, and then there's 480Y trans 480 volt uh, transformers that actually feed the transmitter buildings. So you can see that these are scattered around um, around that site. And these white enclosures, again, those are where the actual transmitters are located. There's 30 of these uh, enclosures with the transmitters in them. So that's a pretty good aerial view of uh, of the site. Um, one of the questions that always pops up is how do you keep from getting cooked? Now you can actually walk underneath this, um, uh, the IRI when it's in full operation. And one of the um, things that was done a number of years ago when they first built the site is they spent, um, I think almost a month up there making measurements everywhere on the site um, operated the transmitter at full power and then made um, uh, RF radiation measurements to see what the levels were. And um, as it turned out, the, um, the radiation levels, the RF radiation levels on that site uh, were pretty much negligible if you were underneath the, the ground screen below the antennas. In fact, they, uh, I was told by one of the people that was involved in those measurements that um, the, the field strength from a local AM radio station uh, 15, uh, so either 15 or 20 miles away uh, was higher than the radiation uh, at ground level produced by the, by the instrument itself. So it's, um, it's a pretty safe place to work. Now there's 180 cross dipole antennas. That means there's 360 dipoles out there. And um, so that means you have to have 360 of everything. Um, they're identical in every way. It's in a 12 by 15 matrix uh, on the site. You have 360 transmitters. Each transmitter is uh, uh, full power, uh, 10 kW, um, and that gives you a total of 3.6 megawatt maximum total uh, transmit power. Now those antennas have gain, so your effective radiated power is going to be 
higher than that. I'll show you that in a minute. Now these transmitters are all automatically and continuously turned when uh, tuned when in operation. And uh, this can happen very quickly. Uh, they can change frequencies very quickly. And uh, uh, so everything is operating. Um, each one of those individual transmitters is operating on its own under control of, uh, of the system. Now, this is the dipole configuration. And um, I mentioned that there was a high band and low band. Uh, this uh, left-hand drawing over here is, shows the high band dipole. It's the darker uh, lines that you see. Um, the the uh, lighter colored lines are the low band dipole shown here in the middle. And um, the, the, uh, the physical distance of, of, this, uh, of the low band dipole from tip to tip is 21 meters. And over here, I'm showing uh, the composite drawing of both the low and high band and with the switches and uh, even mode load units, antenna matching units. Now here's the ground, screen, uh, ground screen here, and it's about five meters above ground level. And um, it goes, extends 12 meters beyond the perimeter. So you'll have a mast, this ground screen will extend out beyond that by about 12 meters. So uh, uh, it's quite a substantial ground screen and it's above ground. So you walk, when you're on site, you're walking underneath uh, the ground screen. This chart here shows uh, the HARP facility with respect to other high powered transmitters around the world. And um, <clears throat> it's the blue line here at the top. And you can see that the, um, it's not only the most powerful transmitter in the world, but it, um, it, it's a humongous power. I mean, this thing is at 10 megahertz uh, is capable of putting out uh, 95 and a half dBW. So um, uh, qu uh, quite a far cry from, from say a, a hundred watt uh, amateur radio transmitter, which is uh, what uh, uh, 30 d uh, uh, 10 dBW. Now, I'd like to show you some block diagrams of, of various parts of this transmitter. Um, this is the equipment that's on the tower. Now, I mentioned the high band or the high low band switch that's shown over here on the left. And then the antenna matching units uh, are shown here in the middle. And um, uh, I have a photograph of one sitting on a pallet here on the far right. So this image is uh, of the antenna matching unit that is uh, that the cover has been taken from. And now one of the things that um, about this HARP facility, uh, the transmitter, is that there are sensors and um, alarming units on every almost every component in it uh, so that everything is monitored and under control and if there's any problem with any transmitter, it's automatically shut down. Uh, they monitor standing wave, uh, voltage standing wave ratio uh, on each one of the dipole elements. They uh, monitor, if you can think of something that needs to be monitored or should be monitored, it is monitored by this, uh, all of this facility. Now the, um, the transmitter is, is, operates under an FCC license. That's our Federal Communications Commission. It's a, an experimental test license, XT. Uh, has a call sign. Um, it's a fixed station, so it has an FX uh, in the call sign. And its authorized power depends on the frequency. So the license calls this out that uh, at the lower frequencies, um, uh, it's 400 and uh, point, almost a half a gigawatt of uh, ERP. And at the higher frequencies, it's uh, 3.6 gigawatt ERP. The maximum allowed bandwidth uh, is 46 kilohertz. Uh, so that, in other words, when you have this, this pure carrier tone, 
that you're transmitting, you can modulate it uh, so that, um, uh, but the emission bandwidth cannot exceed 46 kilohertz. And another thing that the license requires, and this was uh, included when the Air Force operated it as well, is that uh, individual frequencies are notched out. So in other words, that transmitter does not um, actually, uh, it's prevented from tuning to um, specific frequencies. So when you program the transmitter uh, to sweep through a range of frequencies, for example, it will, um, uh, it'll sweep through, but then it'll stop transmitting when it hits these uh, individual frequencies that are to be notched out. This image here um, shows the, um, the dipoles and also the ground screen. Now this, uh, these lines here, I hope you can see these. These are the ground screen. I, I took this picture from the ground. So I'm looking up through the ground screen, um, which is directly above me, roughly five meters. And, um, and then the actual uh, dipoles, you can see uh, here's the support arms for the dipoles and you can see the drooping members. Now these uh, parts of these are conductive and then they're connected to this um, uh, structural unit here. And this is tied then down or anchored down to another mast and that's a non-conductive element there. So this, this cobweb that you're seeing here is uh, conductive as well as non-conductive guy wires, messenger strands and so on that hold all this stuff together. Everything is, um, every one of these masts and the antennas are tied to almost every other uh, adjacent mast as well. So that gives you the, the structural, the strength that you need for that. This is a, um, a zoomed in picture of the antenna matching units. They look like garbage cans. Um, they're, oh, in the neighborhood of maybe a half a meter in diameter. And uh, there's, uh, uh, you can see that they're, they're mounted up here, one for the high band and one for the low band. This image down in the lower right shows one of the uh, connecting um, brackets that uh, you have conductive elements coming down from the dipoles, and then you have non-conducting elements that are used for support. Um, and there's uh, literally, um, hundreds and hundreds of these things that hold this antenna together. Now there's nothing in this transmitter that is uh, off the shelf. Everything is custom made, was, was custom made, and um, uh, basically a one-time manufacturer. They have lots of spares and um, they had a lot of quality control problems very early on. Uh, basically, uh, what it amounted to is that some of the manufacturers that built this stuff shipped junk, and uh, they ended up having to uh, make good, and they did. And um, uh, now the, the system operates very, very reliably compared to what it did when they first fired it up. And by firing it up, uh, that's not just a laughing term either. That, uh, they did uh, burn up a lot of stuff. Now here's the transmitter enclosures. I mentioned that there's 30 of them total. Um, so there's, uh, they look like shipping containers and in fact uh, are modified shipping containers. This is a block diagram of the transmitter. And you can see by looking at this that this is not just a 10 kW uh, box out there. There's uh, these, what they call automatic level control boards. And this is a, a, a pretty complicated uh, electronic printed circuit board um, that does more than just level control. It does frequency control. It does all your frequency sweep, your modulation. Uh, basically everything comes off of this board. You have an RF input uh, that comes in at 10 milliwatts. And the first thing it goes to is a 50 watt driver. And um, that adds some gain. And then that goes into a one kilowatt 
intermediate power amplifier and through a bypass switch where they can actually bypass the 10 kW power amplifier if they want to. And there's a lot of times when they want to do that. Basically, uh, they just want to uh, send a signal up. They don't want to fire up a full 10 kW, but uh, they can put up uh, um, about a kilowatt into the antenna. And you notice there's uh, directional couplers. Uh, these were, uh, are where they tap off the signal, monitor it, alarm it if there's any kind of problems, um, and so on. And then you have an output switch. That's uh, the last thing that goes through on in the transmitter building and goes out to the antenna. And they have portable 10 kW dummy loads that they move around when they're doing testing. They um, operate the output switch into the dummy load. So they're not actually transmitting uh, when they're doing their, their tests and alignment. Everything is calibrated. Um, every piece that you see here is calibrated in, in uh, some shape or form uh, to make it all work as basically a precision instrument. Here's a, an image of uh, the 50 uh, watt driver amplifier. That's this guy right here, if you can see my mouse. Um, but that's the 50 watt driver uh, that is uh, shown down there. This is a, a view of the inside of the, uh, one of the transmitter buildings. And um, over here on the left, the covers have been removed. And this is actually an, an inductor, a variable inductor here. It's not a coil. Um, uh, let's see, do I have a photograph of that? I don't have a photograph of that in this presentation, but basically what it does uh, to make this a variable inductor is it has these shorting bars. And these shorting bars then are driven by a jack screw up or down and short out the, short out the, uh, the rods that you see here that form uh, part of the inductor. So that makes it a variable inductor. And um, um, it's quite interesting to watch that thing in operation. This is a view of uh, one of the transmitters. These uh, transmitters operate and push, uh, have two tubes and operate and push pull. And so they're mounted down here um, in the lower left of this uh, slide. And you see these chimneys here that carry um, uh, the air, uh, it's forced air cooled, and it carries that air uh, to the out, outdoors. And here's um, uh, an output feed line connector that um, you can see that this is fairly robust uh, coaxial cable here. I believe it's an inch and five eighths heliax and um, uh, it's coupled in through these special couplings uh, to the out, uh, transmitter outputs. And this is a, a, a photograph of uh, up in the upper right hand corner is a photograph of one of those connectors. And it's a, a clamped connector and is capable of handling uh, 10 kW um, uh, plus a substantial uh, VSWR where the voltages can get pretty doggone high. This is a, a photograph of one of the tubes. Um, and you can see that there's a mallet in the background that they use to beat them into submission if they have to. But uh, there's two of these in each transmitter. They're the EMAC uh, 4CX10,000D. Now, um, that line of tubes have been around for quite a long time. I, I can remember working on uh, uh, the 4CX, I think a 400, which is a 400 watt version of that. And that goes way, way back. Here's a 50 watt driver under test. Uh, they have all of this test equipment on site. They do all of their testing, calibration, everything on site, uh, uh, an awful lot of their repairs they do on site. Um, there are some of the, some of the electronic boards uh, they uh, need to send to a manufacturer for repair or replacement, but they've got lots of spares or everything uh, to keep this, this thing running. This is a photograph of the operations center and a power plant. 
And um, this, this is an odd building. The, um, uh, you can see uh, the relative scale here. Here's some automobiles that are parked down here in the parking lot just outside. So it's quite a large building. And uh, this site was originally set up uh, to be an over the horizon radar facility. And this would have been back in about 1990 or so. And uh, that project was canceled for whatever reason. And they repurposed the site for, the, uh, for research. And uh, so the lower level of this building here is, is in use. It's in complete use. But this upper, region, upper area of this building is, there's just a big empty space up there. And you can see the, the uh, exhaust mass coming from the uh, generators in the power plant, which is over here on the, the right-hand side of the image. And this is a, a picture of um, a couple of the diesel engines and generators that are used for that. There's uh, five uh, 4,000 horsepower uh, generators or engines and um, for a total of uh, three megawatt. And these, it turns out these are ex Navy tug engines. Um, they were, they were uh, a refurbished engine when the facility was built and they've been uh, taken care of since then. Probably one of the few times the Navy ever cooperated with anybody uh, about um, anything. And so these uh, engines then came out of a Navy tug and ended up in uh, Gakona, Alaska. They're coupled, the engines are coupled to a 2.6 megawatt electrical generators that you can see here on the right, um, right side of the image. This is a picture of the operations control center, all of the, uh, uh, the, the chairs and, and uh, desks and everything have been moved away for the, pic for the uh, picture. But uh, this is where everything is operated. Um, the, the site uh, can't, some, some aspects of the site can be monitored remotely, but uh, basically when they're running this transmitter, they've got somebody here that's uh, in charge of, of making it all work. Now, uh, when you're transmitting, into the ionosphere and heating it up and so on. Um, what, what about uh, all of the stuff that happens as a result of that? Well, those are called, uh, that's called diagnostics. And so you have these diagnostic instruments and um, they identify and characterize the physical processes that are going on in the ionosphere when this thing is in operation. There's, uh, a whole suite of instruments that, that are used to measure the effects. And you can actually, um, uh, if you go to this website here, they, uh, a lot of this data that the diagnostic instruments produces is online. Now, this, uh, this is fairly new. They, we revamped the website just recently. I think it was, uh, uh, I think we started doing it in uh, the fall of 2020. And uh, so now almost everything is online now. So you can actually go there and get HARP data now, uh, something that you couldn't do for several years after the Air Force uh, bailed out of the site. There's magnetometers that are on site. Uh, there's some of the experiments involved um, affecting the, uh, the, mag the local magnetic field. And those are uh, monitored and measured uh, by my magnetometers. There's, uh, there's flux, gate, flux gate magnetometers. There's a search coil magnet uh, or induction magnetometer on site as well. Uh, again, this data um, from this site is online. And if you go uh, to the previous, uh, uh, to the website and go under the magnetometer field or tab, then uh, you'll see there's a selection of locations and Gakona is the one that uh, corresponds to HARP. Here's the induction uh, magnetometer, uh, uh, an example of the data that comes from that. 
Um, you can actually download these dynamic spectra images uh, along with uh, the data that goes along with it. And um, this, uh, the induction magnetometer uh, is uh, looking at frequencies between a tenth and one hertz. So uh, very low frequency type stuff. They also have uh, what they call rapid run magnetogram. Um, and it's a, a kind of an abbreviated version of the 24 hour magnetogram that I showed previously. And again, uh, this data is available uh, from the, from the uh, Geophysical Institute's web, HARP website um, and all the data that goes along with, uh, with the actual images is, is uh, available there too. And this, um, this is primarily, primarily looking at the changes. Um, so it'd be the, uh, the slope of the uh, H, D, and Z with respect to time. And uh, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, there's a lot of data available to you there. Now, one of the instruments that's really important at the HARP facility is the uh, ionosond. Now they have a it's a it's a digital ionosond. It's called a digisond. It operates under a call sign, um, like all uh, digisonds in the U.S. Uh, they have to be licensed uh, in some form or another. And what it does is measures the height profile of the ionosphere. And it's really important for the frequency management of the IRI because the uh, transmit frequency of the R IRI depends on the plasma frequency and gyro frequency and so on. And they need to know what those are uh, to transmit. So they're almost making frequency de decisions almost in real time um, when this thing is in operation. It also, the Digisond also operates as a diagnostic instrument. So in other words, they, they uh, might modify the ionosphere above the site and the uh, Digison then is going to measure that uh, the amount of that modification. So it's kind of a, a feedback loop. Here's a, a typical image that comes from that particular site. This was taken uh, back in May uh, of this year. And um, it shows in this particular one shows uh, altitude from 80 kilo, kilometers uh, up to 900 kilometers. And then uh, that the horizontal scale here along the bottom is uh, frequency up to 10 megahertz. So you can see that things are happening uh, in the neighborhood uh, below five or six megahertz in this, in this particular um, uh, ionosond. This is a block diagram of the Digisond. Um, there are receive antennas, there's four of them in a triangular shape, and then the transmit antennas are across um, inverted V dipole antennas, and uh, they're all hooked back into the transmitter. I've got an a image of the, this is the uh, Digison transmitter and receiver. All of those uh, antennas are connected to this box here. And um, uh, it's been there for quite a while. It's part of the original uh, instrumentation at HARP. So it's been there for what, uh, 20, 20 years, 20 plus years now. This is a image of one of the uh, crossed loop antennas that are used with the Digison. So this is the receive antenna for the Digison. And uh, so these are crossed loops and you can see one in the foreground here and one in the background. And so what, I'm, what this photograph is looking at is this uh, antenna here. And the one that you see in the background is the one in the middle. These two antennas here are out of view behind uh, the trees. The transmit antenna is a, uh, a crossed inverted V. And um, you can see if you look very closely at this picture, you can see three towers, uh, three of the five towers. There's one in the foreground here, one uh, in back, and then you can just barely, barely see 
one uh, quite a ways back in the back there. And then there's two off to the side that, that are out of the picture. And so these uh, are uh, the transmit antenna. And what you're trying to do with these is transmit basically straight up into the ionosphere. And then uh, you receive the signals with the uh, cross loop antennas shown there. There are other diagnostic instruments as well. Um, you've got radiometers, uh, which are total power receivers that operate VLF and ELF. Um, the uh, signals that are crossing the polar cap um, are interesting to study when the HARP is in operation. Um, you're also interested in, in, the, in the radio noise background. And there's a, a Japanese university that's, that has um, uh, a radiometer on site that um, uh, is in full operation 24 seven. And they use it for a lot of, for their own uh, uh, type stuff, but all of their data is available so that when, in, when HARP is in operation, they cooperate with uh, the HARP operation to, uh, to do specific types of research. This is an example of their radiometer antenna. And you look at that and you say, wow, that's, that looks like just a couple droopy antennas. And yes, it is. It's a, um, a crossed loop. And if you look closely at this, um, here's one of the loops here. And then another one here. So that um, uh, it, apparently these, uh, these antenna elements, loop elements don't need to be pulled tight. Uh, these are the support strands that go to, to uh, concrete block anchors. And if you notice the ground around here, this was taken in the spring and uh, the ground is quite swampy. So uh, it's been placed on a platform all of this equipment that you see here is in waterproof containers uh, because they're not, they not only get snowed and rained on, but uh, uh, this, it's awfully wet back in here. And I don't think this, where this particular antenna is, I don't think this ever really dries out that, that much. So here's an example of the data that comes from that radiometer. Um, the VLF ELF radiometer, and uh, it looks like just a lot of colored, um, a, a colored graph, spectrometer type graph. But uh, there's a lot of information in there, and uh, if you're so inclined, the data is available uh, where you, you can um, do your own analysis of this if you want. This this particular uh, chart has a 10 minute time span. And the frequency range covered is zero to 10 kilohertz. There are also um, other VLF type instruments that are used. They, um, I don't think there are any on site, but um, there are VLF instruments located around Alaska that are used for remote sensing when the harp is in operation. Uh, and these are used to locate the rural electrojet boundary. Remember, that's your current system that flows uh, at uh, um, high latitudes. And um, it also tells you a little bit about the temperature and electron density in the D region. Another facility that's used uh, during HARP research campaigns is the Super Darn, the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network. And this is a worldwide HF radar network, uh, operates uh, from eight to 22 megahertz. And it, you'll notice that there's uh, some overlap here at the lower end of the super darn frequency range that uh, overlaps with the um, upper end of the HARP uh, transmitter frequencies. Now there are three super darn sites in Alaska only one of them, and that's on Kodiak Island, which is uh, uh, south of Anchorage. Um, it is the one that covers HARP. 
So when HARP is in operation, the super darn is used to gather uh, details about the ionosphere that's being altered by the HARP uh, uh, HF pump or the, the uh, heater. There's also rheometers on site. A rheometer is used to measure the galactic radio background. There's lots of names given to that. Uh, uh, I've got some of them listed here, galactic background radiation, uh, galactic radio noise, cosmic noise, cosmic no radio noise, and so on. Um, and this measures, uh, uh, has a background or a quiet day curve when things are, um, there's nothing going on in terms of cosmic radio noise. And then it becomes elevated uh, because of some kind of uh, activity uh, in the ionosphere. And um, so this instrument then is used with the HARP during research campaigns uh, to see what, what's going on there. And this is mainly a D and E region absorption that's measured at 30 megahertz. Of course, there's optical instruments up there as well, because one of the, one of the things that they do is make artificial aurora, and uh, or they call that uh, air glow. And uh, these uh, imaging instruments um, at HARP uh, are used to photograph that and study it and so on. There's also uh, optical imaging instruments in other locations in Alaska that are able to see the ionosphere above HARP, and they use those to triangulate um, and determine characteristics of the of this so-called artificial aurora. And it's also used uh, even for natural aurora as well. This is one of the uh, um, domes that's used with the optical instruments. It's closed up uh, when this, this uh, photograph was taken. There's uh, several, several of these uh, on the site. There's other instruments that are used um, to make this whole system work together. And that's, uh, they have aircraft radar, they have a, a, a TCAS, a traffic collision avoidance system, aircraft detection system up there. And these work together to automatically shut down the IRI if there is an intrusion. Um, usually it'll be some wayward uh, pilot in a super cub tooling along and um, maybe gets into uh, the area. And if it's detected, then the transmitters automatically shut down um, if that airplane comes in that area. And um, this is a photograph of, the, of that part of the facility. You can see the radar antenna. This is an ordinary marine radar uh, uh, transmitter receiver that uh, is shown here. And, um, and then you have your TCAS, here's your GPS antenna. There's probably five or six, maybe even seven GPS receivers scattered around the site um, so that everything is operating in lockstep. So this is a really important part of that facility is uh, for detecting those wayward pilots that, that might have not got the word. Now, before every uh, research campaign, the Federal Aviation Administration in the U.S. sends out what they call NOTAMs or notices to airmen and uh, says that uh, don't go flying into this area. And it gives the specific details of that, uh, the times, the dates, and so on. Um, but not everybody gets the word. So they have this uh, radar and TCAST to uh, shut down the facility for those people that don't get the word. Now there's uh, some uh, non-HARP instrumentation uh, on the site. There's uh, one GPS receiver. I, in fact, I shared an enclosure with, with a GPS receiver that was used for measuring total electron content. And that would be the, uh, basically the electron density between the, the GPS satellite and the GPS receiver on the ground. Now this um, photograph down in the lower right here is that rheometer antenna that I showed earlier. Now, um, when this, this rheometer antenna and this facility receiver, um, 
when HARP is not operating, uh, this the Japanese university that runs this is using this for their own projects. So this is really a non-HARP um, uh, type uh, experimental campaign that's going on. But when HARP is in operation, then uh, they do they do a share and cooperate. So not everything on the HARP site is is uh, directly related to HARP. It's uh, basically available for research. Um, there's power, there's internet, um, it's a rural area, so it's electrically quiet and so on. So it's really attractive um, for, the, for something like that. And in fact, that's one of the things that attracted me to it was the, the quiet rural um, area. Now, what about citizen science? The, um, uh, there was a campaign in 2017 where the uh, HARP transmitter was used to, to demonstrate this, the so-called Luxembourg effect um, as a crowdfunded funded experiment. Now, this was something that uh, takes advantage of nonlinear effects in the ionosphere when you have a, a very uh, high-powered transmitter uh, that affects the ionosphere. And as far as I know, that was a successful in, uh, uh, campaign. There was another one in 2018 where the weak signal propagation reporter, the whisper protocol, protocol was invoked um, on the HARP. And then uh, it, the, uh, the whisper uh, project was used to observe what stations received the transmission. And so they, they were able, even though this was citizen science uh, type project, uh, there is some real science that came out of that. So the, the whisper um, is extremely low speed uh, FSK type uh, uh, modulation. And um, they actually programmed the HARP transmitter to, to, uh, to do that. There was a, a campaign in 2019 where that was funded by the, uh, an arts council, council in Canada. And um, uh, the lady that got the funding from the, the arts council came up to the HARP facility and um, she had these, uh, a list of experiments that, uh, uh, that they paid for. And it turned out that not only did she get her art out of it, um, this is a, a, a brain scan here uh, that she transmitted with the HARP transmitter. But um, even though this was a, an arts council project or funded by an arts, arts council, uh, there was actually science observations uh, that, that came out of this. So, um, she cooperated with uh, the scientists uh, up there, and um, they were able to, to take advantage of heating the uh, ionosphere uh, for this, uh, for these slow scan television type transmissions that, that they were making. Okay, well, so that pretty much brings me to the end. Um, here's some uh, links here. The, uh, the HARP homepage is, it's easy to remember. It's uh, just harp.gi.alaska.edu. And from there, then you can get to um, a, a long list of uh, publications that have been produced as a result of uh, experiments that the Air Force, the Navy, uh, uh, universities and so on have done at HARP since uh, 1990s. So those, uh, the, the list is online. Not all of the pu publications are directly accessible. You have to search for them separately. Um, and of course I have, um, uh, I've written, oh, probably at least a dozen articles on HARP and that's on my website, uh, uh, reeve.com. You can go there and, and hunt around and, and find these articles uh, for that. And uh, by the way, the, I'm showing um, the uh, HTTP here. Well, last night I converted this to uh, HTTPS. So it's uh, using a, um, a secure type uh, setup now that just changed within the last 12 hours. So that's pretty much it. Um, I'll be glad to take questions if you have any. I'm gonna 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to unshare Paul and um, then if you got any questions, I'll be glad to take them. We do have a little time for uh, questions this evening, uh, one or two perhaps. Uh, which I was um, interested in the um, uh, the screen, the ground screen that was uh, that's under the um, the antenna array and beneath which field strengths are really uh, very low. Um, was that is that of the form of a mesh, and uh, is there any any feeling for um, the the size of the mesh? Uh, 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 yeah, it is a mesh, and um, the dimension of the mesh, I believe, is maybe a quarter of a meter, maybe a half a meter mesh. Um, it's not, it's uh, one of those, uh, the images that I showed, in fact, let me, Paul, if you'll let me share the screen again, I'll go back. You should have it. Okay, let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, if you if you can see my mouse, you know, I can't even see my own mouse. Okay, there we go. If you can see my mouse, this is the ground screen mesh right here. And that's about, uh, oh, four meters above uh, my camera. So that looks to me like in the neighborhood of about a half a meter. So that, that mesh then covers this entire site and extends out beyond it by about 12 meters. So it's quite extensive. Does that answer your question, Paul? Uh, yes, so the, the, the top frequency is 30 megs, wavelength 10 meters. Um, so that's, um, uh, what about 20th of... Actually, no, the, the transmitter, um, the highest frequency it transmits is 10 megahertz. So this is a small, so this mesh would be a small fraction of the, of the wavelength at 10 megahertz. Thank you. Yep. Do we have any more questions? If I may. If you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Totally good. Um, I went to a fascinating visit on a visit with an astronomy society to Cambridge to the Mallard Radio Astronomy Observatory. And there was a technician there who um, gave the tour, a very good chap, um, talking about HARP. And we looked at a one unit that he was had apparently worked on. I just wonder if it's the same HARP as the one we've been talking about, whether they were developed at Cambridge at all? No, I don't know anything about uh, the facility at Cambridge. They may have uh, used similar transmitters or antennas, but um, uh, you know, maybe the same manufacturer built the pieces for it. But as far as I know, the, um, the HARP is a uh, unique in that uh, it's the only one like it in the world. Now there may be, um, maybe there were some parts left over that they were able to use uh, somewhere else, but uh, I, I haven't heard any specific details about that. No, okay, thank you. That's a very good talk, very enjoyable, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Otherwise, we shall move on. 
Okay, I'm going to stop sharing then, Paul. Okay. All right. Thank you. Most excellent. Yes. Thank you very much, Wit. That was that was really interesting. Um, moving on to something completely different. Um, we've got a day conference coming up in October, and I would just like to hand over to uh, to Paul Hyde, who's got a few things he wants to say. Paul, it's yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just uh, bringing up the uh, relevant screen. Um, it's looking good. Oh, Paul, you've muted yourself. Thank you for that. Is that better? Yes. Uh, I don't know what went wrong there, but I lost control of uh, mute and unmute. Okay, so um, yeah, so we're getting the agenda together for that uh, day conference on the 16th of October. Um, just to give you a list of where we are at the moment, the individual presentations and poster sessions. Um, and just to say that uh, we've still got uh, uh, slots available and we can uh, adjust timings. So if you do have something, even uh, a short presentation of uh, 10 minutes, a poster session, um, then um, please let me know uh, and we will see about uh, um, uh, fitting you in. Um, that's, that's, I think, it. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Paul. So this will be um, on October the 16th. And as far as tonight is concerned, Paul, you can uh, unshare now. Okay, that's um, uh, right. Stop share. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Paul. Um, right. That's all I have down for this evening. Um, is there anybody that wants to make a comment or share something that they haven't um, notified me about? No. Okay. Um, that concludes uh, that concludes our seminar for this evening. Um, once again, great thank you to um, to Wit, who once again has um, entertained and educated us this evening. Um, thanks, Wit. That was great. So until until next time. Um, good night and uh, God bless. Bye bye now. Thank you.